welcome to the podcast, episode 8, Elders Rising. Okay, read 27 again. This is Ether 12, 27. <clears throat> and if men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness, that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me, and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. That's a powerful scripture. That's scripture mastery. Uh, it's famous scripture, and, and I love that scripture. <coughs> One of my favorite scriptures is the scripture right before it, 26. And I think that um, it's often overlooked as well. But we'll read 26, will you? And when I had said this, the Lord spake unto me, saying, Fools mock, but they shall mourn. And my grace is sufficient for the meek, that they shall take no advantage of your weakness. Fools mock, but they shall mourn. You know, it's it's easy to get worried about how people are going to make fun of you. It's easy to get worried about how people will take advantage of the stupid things you do. Because we all do stupid things. We're all incompetent in some way or another. But... That statement, that simple, simple statement, fools mock, but they shall mourn. And then after that, he follows it up. The Lord follows it up with, I make men, I, I give men weakness so that they will be humble. For my grace is sufficient for those, for the humble. That's why, that's why we're imperfect. One of the reasons is so that we can be humble. And, um, I don't know, I'm doing these podcasts, we kind of put ourselves out there in a way that's not comfortable it's not normal i don't like it yeah it's 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 not super pleasant but it's something that needs to be done it needs to be said and it opens up ourselves to be to completely be ridiculed and mocked and that's that's fine fools mock but they shall mourn when you when you are around people who derive their humor or around people who gain um clout by making fun of others Realize that's a fool. That's someone who is not not worth your time. Um, and don't don't stand for it. And don't be the type of person who gains joy of the of the weaknesses of others. That's that's foolish. That's what Satan wants you to do. Not only is it foolish, it's weak. Yeah. Fools mock, but they shall mourn. It's one of my favorite statements and. The whole Book of Mormon. I love it. It's good. Um, one of the reasons that got me on thinking on this is, so we were talking about it a little just before we started, but um, the story that I read last week, it, it impacted me in a very powerful way when I read it the first time. And it, well, each of the times I've read it, it's, it's powerful. Um, I was doing a little bit more research this week, and... It looks like I mean there's it looks like it it's uh there's there's evidence that's a f fabrication, but there's also evidence that it was like it's basically from a secondhand source, and the things were like the years and names were changed, and stuff like that. It, it, if it is true, then it's not accurate to what was actually happened. Anyways, it's it's one of those things that I don't know what everything that you read in history take it with a grain of salt, but the lessons that you learn. Don't um, discredit those. The fact that we need to be, um, we need to be cognizant of the role of government, and it's not the role of government to distribute wealth, distribute our wealth. Those things are true. Also, it's very true that if I, I, that that there are people that you that you reverence, and. It's important to have a, a healthy balance of, of not hero-worshipping people. We shouldn't put people on a pedestal that we worship them. Christ, Christ alone and God is who we should pray and kneel to. But also respect people in a way that when they deserve it, that's, that's, there's, there's, there's goodness in that. There's something important in that. That's something that I was thinking. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, welcome to episode eight. You already told him that. Is it eight? Yeah, it's eight. Wow, I oh. thought it was seven. 
No, last week was seven. Does anybody actually watch this? All seven of them. I wouldn't. <laughs> I did see that there was like 10 subscribers on our YouTube. Yeah. We'll take 10. <laughs> That's the thing is like, I don't, like like we've said before. I don't know what that means. <laughs> we, I always hear people say like, share, and comment or subscribe or whatever. Gotta chase that YouTube algorithm. Yeah. Smash that like. Uh, my kids were watching YouTube a little bit too much. Whenever I take videos of them, they'd be like, don't forget to subscribe. And, and I'd be like, why are you saying this? This is the weirdest thing ever. Anyways, um, where was it going? Oh, we appreciate those that, um, that share it. And thank you. Um, those that... We're not, we're not doing this again for our comfort or our fame or our anything. It's... I don't think we're even doing it because we want to. No. (laughs) Because I am damn tired. (laughs) (laughs) But we both know that there are things that need to be done and said. And that's, that's why we're, that's why we're saying them. And that's why we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Things have gotten into kind of a dangerous predicament. And... We feel the need to share the Constitution and help help people better understand it. They can't see it. <laughs> help help people to better understand it, so we know what's in there. We know um, what we're talking about. We know our rights and. And we know the role that of it's government. almost a almost forgotten scripture. One of the things that we were we've been talking about this week a little bit back off and on is how regardless of the political party, the government has grown and that's been a bad thing for the people. Um, it doesn't matter when the government is sm- the size that it's meant to be in this document. When the government, referring to the Constitution, when the government is limited, the people flourish. And part of that is as long as we follow God. But um, it doesn't matter who's controlling the government if the government doesn't have the ability to interfere with your personal life. If the government does have the ability to interfere with your personal life, then it matters a lot more who's, who's holding the power. And right now, because of how large the federal government is and how big government in general is, we are, our lives are impacted heavily. And they shouldn't be. Part of it we can, we can alleviate. We can, we can do better ourselves at not being dependent on the government, not being dependent on both the government and just others. Stand on your own two feet. There's 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 value and beauty in that, and that's something that we we as a society have in in many ways forgotten and gotten away from. When it's time to look at your elections and look at your or look at your ballots and look at the different um, things that they're passing, a good a good idea is to always 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 be for shrinking the government which very few amendments and very few um, things that they try and pass do that. But if they, if they do that, that's the things that you want to support, in my opinion. That's, that's I, I mean, I'm not, I don't, it's not my place to tell people what to do, but that's what I try to do. Well, <clears throat> government was only, and I just looked it up, I was wrong. Um, the government's only supposed to be big enough to fit in four pieces of parchment. That the Constitution was written on. For a reason. As little interference as possible. It's like uh, what when I was talking about last week about how mask mandates violate the Constitution. And the very first thing I stated was the government should leave people alone. 
and they should. And you should be more demanding of that. What does that look like? I mean, here's I'm I'm looking at the different things that we have to go through for um, driving a car. Yeah, you, you have to be licensed. You have to have your car licensed. You have to have insurance. The different things you have to look and do for um, building your house, building additions on your house, doing just the day to day things in our lives that, like, there's. It, it, I I don't know what do. You, to me, it was always interesting because you do want to in a, when you get more people put together in a small in a smaller location, especially in like cities and stuff like that. They have to have ways to control the city so that it doesn't so it's not completely so they can run get everybody can have water and and power and stuff like that. But what at what cost does that come? You know, I don't know. Well, I definitely feel more free living where I do than I ever do even just visiting the city. Yeah. You know, I I went to D.C. in December, and that's probably the biggest city I've ever, like, really been in. I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the trip itself was cool. I liked it. um, Seeing all that stuff was amazing. Traveling to... um, Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate was really, was really a neat experience. It was, I'd say it was just as uh, spiritual of an experience as anything. You know, we know, we know a lot about George Washington. We know how important he was to the, to the founding of our nation. And to be in his home where he walked, touch the things that he touched, see his things. And I, I don't know, it was, it was a very, just a humbling spiritual experience. Um, and underneath the, the grounds, they have a museum about George Washington. And it was really neat. You get to see a picture of his teeth. So that was cool. Or not a picture of his teeth. You get to see his actual teeth. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's kind of gross. <laughs> were they wood? <laughs> no. I don't know why everybody thinks his teeth were made out of wood. That's a damn lie. <laughs> he cut down a cherry tree. No, that's not true either. I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was just such a neat, humbling experience. And Arlington was the same way. See, look, there's his teeth. Oh, wow. There's his teeth. Well, a pair of his teeth. That's why he was always so crotchety looking, I guess. But, uh, no, that was such a neat exper- experience. And they had this one display there in the museum underneath underneath the grounds that said he could have been a king. And it had a mannequin of him wearing a robe and a crown and with a scepter and, and all that. Mm-hmm. And, and it says that it says he could have been King and then it fades, um, and dark and blacks out that that mannequin and that, uh, portrayal of him to him and, you know, his, you know, gentleman clothes or whatever, whatever you would call them back then. <laughs> and says, but instead he chose, to return to private life at, at Mount Vernon. What a just extraordinary man. Probably about, I would imagine, the first person to ever be handed something like that and saying, no, I don't want it. That's not what we just fought for. And he didn't want to do it. He just wanted to go home. And so he did his two terms and he went home. Why is that so difficult for those who represent us now? A man could have had all the power over an entire nation and chose not to. Chose. 
it's a false idea that someone who's been in government for a longer time is better at being in government. That's a that's wrong in itself because I want the guy who has no idea what the hell he's doing. <laughs> yeah, that's there's 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 a reason there's limits and there it's people get too comfortable being in positions that are hard to get them out of to become entrenched mm -hmm. with their false sense of authority and power if you are curious if you don't know who to vote for and you haven't done your you haven't done the research that you feel like you should if nothing else vote against the person who's currently holding power <laughs> Typically, yes. That's what I do. If they've served more than two terms, they're not getting a vote regardless of how well they've done. Oh, they've been doing a great job. Mm, how long have they been in? That's exactly... And when it comes to, on the ballot, voting for our judges, or to retain them, I always vote no. Really? Mm-hmm. The founders warned about a... warned us about the judiciary system being... The the arbiters of the Constitution, more or less. Well, look at that. This, uh, there's, and I've shared a bunch of stuff on the Facebook page about the things that they said. Um, none of their quotes are coming to mind right now. The Mel, what was that Melbourne case? I'm sorry. Madison versus Marbury. Hold this. Hold this. Yeah, exactly. That's is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, that one that you sent me, and we were. And where, where basically they um, they talked about how the Supreme Court, the role of the Supreme Court in relation to the lesser courts and how. Oh, that uh, the Mad, Madsen versus Marbury, I think, is eight, was a case from 1809, I believe. Um, it was right around there, the turn of the century. Um but what that court ruling established was that the lower courts can rule on the constitutionality of of sub of subjects. But um, more or less, the main takeaway from that was if a law is unconstitutional, then it can't really be a law. And there's there's all there's a whole bunch of the founders saying that saying those things any any law that's arbitrary to the constitution is null and void well when you say that to some people and they're like oh so you are you downplaying the role of the courts no but i mean yes is, just say yes <laughs> but it's, it is it's their job if it's thing. unconstitutional not to our modern understandings or modern interpretations <coughs> but the intent at the time that it was written the thing that's really interesting to me, though, about that, because um, that that I don't know if it was a, a lesson or whatever that people learned about it, but uh, that, that people did on it that you sent me. But the thing that stuck out to me was how the in that case they they said that it was the um, basically the Supreme Court could help in determining the constitutionality, but it was subject to the Constitution not to an interpretation and not to somebody's mm -hmm. view of the Constitution. It was subject to the Constitution. And over time, that case has been used to legitimize that the Supreme Court has the ultimate say in what the Constitution means, that the, 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 the Supreme Court has the final say. That, that, that court case was kind of that tipping point. And the, and the court case itself, that, that's not what they were saying. They were saying this Constitution has the final say, not the Supreme Court. But... Um, and and one of the things that it brought up in that um, that presentation that lesson or whatever was it was, was a podcast I don't remember but um, the the lawyer he was going into it and he talked about how um, even now the precedence is the the Supreme Court gives a suggestion and in their in their dec in their declarations it's always like we suggest or our opinion is or something like that and I don't remember the actual formal words that they say but it. it it basically states that it's their opinion, and originally it was set up that a that a the lower courts 
they would seek the counsel of the of the Supreme Court when they didn't know, but it wasn't they weren't deferring to the Supreme Court. They were still making the judgment. They were just seeking their counsel and then they could use it if they wanted or not. And now we've got a system that's like, oh, if you don't like the results that you get, then if you get a bad judge that judges wrongly, then you have to go into appeals and you have to go to a higher judge. You have to go to a higher judge. And like, it's, it's just, it's interesting how we've built this hierarchy system. And it's, a lot of it is because we don't have, there's not people that you, there's, there's not that accountability to the people. There's not that accountability mm-hmm. to the people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because they're not subject to election. Exactly. They can't. We can't remove them. And we're less involved. Like it's. You think of like a small town. A small town. If someone if someone does someone dirty, like if someone is cheat someone else or something like that it gets around and people stop doing business with that that person that bad actor they stop they stop working with someone who's going to be treat others poorly but in a big city you can't do that because you just don't have the references you don't know there's so many people that you don't know there there's 15 different contractors that do that same thing and you don't know one from the other and yeah you can talk around but everybody has different stories and it's hard to know who to trust it's hard like one of the things that I noticed, especially with my wife being from Bucharest, which is a city of like 5 million people, um, there's a lot, there's, there's a huge difference. There's differences in cultures, but there's also within the same supposed culture, there's differences in your, the way that you interact with people based off of how large the population is in your area. It's, it's, it's natural and normal, but it's something that you wouldn't, I don't think ever occurred to me and I don't think it's normal to occur to you if, if if you haven't been exposed to it and that's one of the problems with the the how corporate we've gone and how social media has given us all a specific perspective without those those individual interactions you know what I mean mm-hmm. I know what you mean <clears throat> It's setting up a facade of what reality is without actually... And then you go outside and you interact with people and you realize, oh, people aren't as crazy as Twitter. People aren't as crazy as Facebook. Like, the, the there are some people that are that crazy that you'll run into, but most people are normal. They're... they're and, and that's one of the things that the masks is, is efficiently doing is it's getting us to... Not view, not talk to people, it, it, not get to know people. If you can, if you can automatically put someone into a category from from sight that you either hate them or love them, that's a bad place to be in. I did that before the mask. You just hate everyone. <laughs> like, that's that's not like a yeah. That's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the best at giving people the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Oh, goodness. No, um, well, it was like I told you earlier, I went into Walmart today, and I was the only person in there that I saw without a mask. And people weren't looking at each other. They weren't talking to each other. They were all looking at me. It was just kind of doing a, uh, how dare you? Yeah. Clutch their pearls. Yeah. <gasps> how dare you? No, I just don't care. Nobody said anything to me. I still Nobody love said anything to me for a while. Ex- uh, the last person to say anything to me was the lady at the grocery store. But I told her I don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> I still love the, um, the mind your business. What we used to have on the coins. They were first yeah. coins. Mind your business. I looked up those coins. Yeah? You didn't believe me, did you? I did. Oddly. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know why. (laughs) I don't know why I trusted you. Yeah, I mean, that's... uh, It's a good sentiment. Mind your business. Everything would be so much better if everybody just would mind their own business. Instead of worrying about... 
who's wearing a mask and who's not wearing a mask. But, you know, going back to, like, what you said about figuring out what camp people belong in with wearing a mask or, or not. It reminds me of that that music video that I sent you last week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was... I don't know. It was a good message that it sent, I thought. I thought it perfectly depicted and... It kind of summed up how everything's going right now. I don't know. I think that... Especially... Around election time, it's always... Uh, I think that it's getting it's gotten worse that the the divide has gotten larger and larger obviously and anybody who's paying attention sees that but I also think that the more we give the government our attention and our our I mean we have to pay attention you have to do that you can't you have to be informed but the more that you let that dictate your happiness the less healthy it is and the more power it gives the government um, our, our lives are still our lives. There's still, we're still in such a great time. We're still in such, a, there's so many, there's so many things like the, I, I saw a meme the other day that was like, it was a, it was a picture of like a big Mickey Mouse, like almost from like Disneyland, but it was on the ground and there was like weeds growing up over it and stuff like that. And it's like, someday we're going to look back at 2020 and be like, and, and say to ourselves, I wish it was only that bad. <laughs> and it was like depressing, but it was like, that's possible. You know, that is very possible. possible. Probably more possible than not. Well, we know that it is. The, the book Lesson on Liberty by Brian Meekham. I started reading. You gave me this, Mitch, and I really have liked it. You're welcome. My contribution to society. But My life um, is now complete. <laughs> one of the things... Um, there's, this is on page 10, but this is a quote from Gordon B. Hinckley, and I'll read a little bit of it, but it says, That war, so bitter, so bitter, so intense, has never ceased, referring to the war in heaven. He says, It is the war between agency and compulsion, between the followers of Christ and those who have denied him. His enemies have never you have ne have, his enemies have used every stratagem in the in that conflict. They've indulged in lying and deceit. They've employed money and wealth. They've tricked the minds of men. They've murdered and destroyed and engaged in every kind of evil practice to thwart the works of Christ. One of the things that um, I guess kind of come into my mind, though, is... All of the things that, like, there, there's so many things that are we take for granted in life. And I'm talking, like, things that you learn in school, things that you learn. Um, that Even that story that we read with Davy Crockett. It was such a good story and it had such a good message. There are things that are designed to give us an idea of perspective. And it's very, it's very difficult to not be tricked and fooled at some point or another and the people who trick you and fool you will sit and laugh at you like i said fools mock but they shall mourn we have the option to take the good and leave everything else leave the crap there's there's one of my favorite quotes from i think it was it was probably brigham young but i don't remember it's one of the early prophets and he said like something to the effect of if there's if there's truth in hell, we'll find it. And it's like we find find good wherever it is. It's it's simple. Good comes from God. Evil comes from Satan. And when we muddy things up with like, oh, this is not true, or this is true, or this is like truth. Always seek truth. Always seek truth. And even in things that are presented to you in untruth, like Caiaphas, the the um the high priest in the time of Christ, he, he spoke and he said some, some prophetic things that were, he, he said them and he was the high priest of the, of the church supposedly at that time, you know, but 
they were true and not the way that he understood. And they were, they were true to his detriment. He spoke truth unintentionally. And I'm trying to remember, I, I believe the story is in Jesus the Christ. And I, I wish I had it more clearly in my mind. But I guess what I'm saying, the, the, the point I'm trying to illustrate, though, is there are times where even things that are not true bring goodness out of you if you find it. You can find good in everything. And that's why you should look at everybody, regardless of who they are, as having something that they can teach you. You should, you should don't discredit anyone for that, but also don't worship people. Don't think that they are naturally going to be what you see because it's not, it's never that simple. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going off again, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> there's, uh, there's a little bit more that I wanted. I wanted to get into these bullet points if that's okay, but mm -hmm. so going on after that quote from president Hinckley, it says it is apparent that in Satan's attempt to destroy man's freedom and agency and thwart God's plans, Man in uh, many institutions and in thwart and thwart God's plans, he has established much control and influence over many institutions, even the world, even the word of wisdom, which is a guide for health and living for healthy living, states that it was revelation from the Lord given in consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of of conspiring men in the last days. That's in Doctrine and Covenants 89, verse 4. And it says, below is a list of just some of the realms that Satan has influence over. Religion, spirituality. That's the first bullet point. Second one, politics, government. Third bullet point, business and economics. Fourth bullet point, education. Fifth bullet point, science. Sixth bullet point, health, food and drug. Seventh bullet point, media and entertainment news and then more those are all things that like you 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 oftentimes hear references to einstein you hear references to heroes we as people we learn through stories and we take stories to be archetypes of of what's valuable and there's lessons to be learned through stories but also when you start worshiping people and start deferring to people's um people's, uh, what's the right word? I don't know. Like their, uh, authority, deferring to their authority, you're, you're missing, you're, you're, you're opening up yourself to be misled. No, sorry. That's where I was going. Oh, yeah. What are you yearning at? Are you just looking at yourself? And no, I was looking. I was looking at you. He, you just did a long shift at work, and I know you're exhausted. A long week. Um. Yeah, that's. Like the point I was, I was trying to make last week. Um, we did the podcast on Saturday, and I ran into town on Sunday and they do a, a Trump parade every every Sunday and you know I've never seen anything like it and while yeah people are getting out there and they're and they're showing their support and and all that it, it, it's a good thing but like I've shared with you and I've shared with others I I get the feeling that people are instead of putting their trust and their faith in in God to to lead us and guide the direction that we should be going in they're not only putting their trust in a man but they're putting their trust and <laughs> more or less worshiping the executive and the intent and purpose of found, founding this nation 
and the Constitution and everything that they were going against was getting power away from the executive. Uh, our, our faith needs to be put back in God to right the ship. Uh, you know, we are taught and we believe that this is Christ's, Christ's country. And that's where our faith needs to be. Not in the executive. Whether you agree with with Donald Trump or not is kind of irrelevant because the president's not supposed to wield all the power. But we've let them more or less convince us otherwise. Well, the executive branch just has granted itself more and more power, usurping it all from the legislative. And that's something, I, I mean, we were looking it up, and we, we were talking about this earlier, with, um, like, we as a country, we've been to rough places. We've, we've, we've been to some bad places. And... Specifically, I'm thinking of like FDR and I'm thinking of like how he was confiscating gold and he was like there's there are things that that have been done by the government that's that's really messed us up. Really shady, really corrupt, very corrupt. And there are things that have um, we've 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 been able to bounce back from that in a lot of ways. In some ways we haven't. But we really need to be careful because right now is a is a, a shaping point for the next several decades and if we aren't careful and we lead towards the author authoritarian we and we give power to a big government to try and fix the problems that's going to magnify over the next few years if our country stays together it'll be a few decades but you know what I mean? But it never it will never get better. It will, it will never get better unless we make it get better, but too many of us are too complacent mm -hmm. and lazy. And as long as we're kept comfortable, nobody's going to do anything. That's what I mean, everybody knows the downfall of the Romans, you know. Give them what was it? Free entertainment and free bread. Bread and spectacle. Yeah. But getting back to Trump, if you're worshiping him, if you're um, thinking that he's going to be our savior, you're in a bad place. That's not, that's not what you, you shouldn't be looking to the role of government for that. But also, don't, um, don't give that authority to, don't, don't, don't be pleased with that type of authority grab, that power grab. Yeah, it's a dangerous precedent. Like I said, whether you agree with the guy or not, I mean, I think he's done a good job. Um, I agree with most of the things he's done. His positions on most things. There are things that he has done that I don't support, which you will have with any president. But, you know, I don't know that he's done enough to necessarily earn my vote. I'm I am considering between him and the Constitution Party candidate Don Blankenship because his policies, his statements, the, the things that the Constitution Party stand for are the things that I stand for. And he doesn't have a flying snowball's chance in hell to get in because he's not on the ballot in enough states to get the the 270 to win but it becomes a matter of principle voting your your conscience saying to your 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 children your grandchildren and ultimately to God saying you know I voted for the person that I thought was best regardless of the outcome And I don't think a lot of us realize how important that is. 
And I mean, if you still support Trump and you want to vote for Trump, that's fine. I get it. And I don't hold anything against you. But I have two absolute red lines that I don't cross. One is abortion and the other is gun rights. And while Trump has been very pro-life, he has not been the best at defending the Second Amendment. He appointed a very anti-gun director to the ATF, and they've done all that stuff with pistol braces and whatnot, never mind the fact that I should be able to just have a short-barreled rifle anyway. But he also directed the ATF to outlaw bump stocks, which I didn't have one. I didn't plan on getting one. I shouldn't need one. I should be able to buy a full auto if I want to. But he effectively passed, got more anti-gun legislation passed than Obama ever could have dreamed of. He couldn't get anything done. And Republicans say, well, that's okay because, well, nobody really needs it. When that's besides the point. That's like saying you don't need your privacy because you're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Terrible argument. If somebody says that, you should... Slap them. Well, don't slap them. You'll probably go to jail because they're probably a bitch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they're probably a wuss. Oh. But, and so, I mean, it just... People need to realize that Donald Trump is not everything that he says he is and that he pretends to be. Like I said, I don't think he's a bad president. I think he's done the best job that I've seen in... Um, in my lifetime, because I don't remember Reagan, but everybody talks about how great Reagan was, but he also Reagan passed anti-gun legislation. Reagan turned California blue. <clears throat> but. <coughs> That's a reference to his amnesty that he passed. Yeah, so. I mean. Research your options and vote with your conscience. Uh, vote for a third-party candidate that's not throwing your vote away. Whether you vote for um, Joe Jorgensen, Don Blankenship, Kanye West, <laughs> or whoever, it's sending a message to the DNC and the GOP that says, we're sick of these crappy options that you're giving us. Because they see it. I have never before contributed to a campaign or bought bumper stickers, anything like that before. But I donated money to Don Blankenship in the Constitution Party. Really? Mm-hmm. So, I mean... You have to do what you believe is is right and if that's still voting for red or blue vote your conscience but you know we should have our everybody should have in my opinion at least that that line and that red line on abortion I've said it before, and I feel, I feel very strongly about it because I don't like bullies. Obviously, I've never been perfect, <laughs> and I've done things that I probably shouldn't have. Well, I did do things that I know I shouldn't have, and I've acknowledged that as an adult, and I've apologized to people that I've treated poorly, just to treat poorly. Now I treat people accordingly. <laughs> but um, the, the thing that really gets me about abortion uh, is we, in this nation, we, or at least we're supposed to strongly believe in the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when it comes to abortion you are depriving another individual, another United States citizen of those things. The, the declaration is about their states 
life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The Fifth Amendment states life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as well as the Fourteenth Amendment. And I'm not saying that abortion doesn't have a place, because it most definitely does, like, if the mother's life is in danger. Uh, we've never had to be in that position. I hope to never be in that position, and I, you know, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but I mean, you're taking the most innocent and defenseless amongst us and murdering them because you don't want to deal, you don't want to take responsibility for your actions, for the most part. There are other things, but it's just, it's just wrong. Like, I can't think off the top of my head, off the top of my head, anything that is more just fundamentally fundamentally wrong it, it has done nothing wrong and if you were to give any child you know a pre-born child or soon to be born child or in some cases just born to kill the mother they wouldn't do it because they're better than we are Brand new. How do you get them on the voting ballots, though? <laughs> you know, they say that Democrats vote... The, de the, the dead vote for Democrats. I don't know, there was some joke that I heard. We were talking about this earlier, how funny the skit would be to do something with... I don't know. Dark humor, but... We're sick. <laughs> when... We're terrible people. When, um... When it comes down to it, though, you're taking the most innocent thing possible. Something that, I mean... Most innocent and, like and you said, helpless. most defenseless. Yeah. And then you're... Uh, if, if... If you... Th there, there are people who have seen abortions that were pro-choice and after seeing the graphic reality of a late-term abortion what actually happens they they couldn't do it and there's a reason for it because it's it's disgusting it's graphic and very it's evil it's literally killing something that's living that's innocent and pure it's taking something that is that is beautiful and corrupting it beyond any anything you could imagine. Go. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Anybody parents who have seen their kids born and seen life come into the world. I know some people don't like naturally um, what's the term? They don't naturally have that feel of, of, of wonder, but to, to take that and destroy it is, it's evil. It's straight up evil. Taking life is never something that should be done lightly. Um, but I mean, you're talking about a polar opposite for the most part, when it comes to, when it comes to babies. That was a joke that I heard that was like... And we're going to jokes? <laughs> dark humor, I guess. But there was a guy that he was, he was talking to a girl and he's like, they were talking about the whole, oh, if you had a time machine, could you go back and kill Hitler when he was a baby? He's like, oh, I don't know if I could. I don't know. It seems like killing him as a baby and the guy's like okay you're like you you don't know if you'd be able to kill hitler as a baby but you had an abortion last week you're a monster like he, the 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 reference was though this person that that became hitler they were they had second guesses of killing but yet without it without batting an eye they killed a completely innocent child that hadn't done anything you know? We'll never have the chance to do anything. Exactly. 
Like I said, you're depriving another individual of the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think that is the greatest human rights violation of all time. You can feel free to argue with me if you'd really like, but my stance isn't going to change on that. And the thing, the thing that I really just don't understand is that the left, the progressives, and even some Republicans are just like, yeah, just do that. Don't worry about an adoption when if you do an adoption, there are plenty of people out there who will take it. And not only will they take it, they'll take care of all the bills associated with it because they want a child so badly. And they don't even say anything about that as being an option. You look at also, at the same time, there are so many women who they, they're they told to go into a career and to work and to get their jobs before they have a life and ha or get married and have kids and stuff like that. And they become 30, 40 years old and then they realize... I actually want a family and it's too late for them and they can't and it's just it's hell for them because they they're they no longer have the ability to have kids and then they they can't even we're encouraging abortion new york lights up pink when they when bills get passed the way they want them to and it's just like it's disgusting it's it's very wrong I don't know how people are okay with it. I just don't. But it comes down to selfishness, and it is the absolute most hideous form of it. Selfishness causes a lot of problems. But I think that is just the ultimate form of it. You know, like we said... Way, way long ago, like four episodes ago, <laughs> <laughs> there are more abortions in the U.S. every year than at least World War II and the Civil War. But if I'm, if I'm remembering the numbers right off the top of my sleep-deprived mind, which I'm probably not, it doesn't work right when I'm, when I'm really awake either, <laughs> but... I believe that there's more abortions every year than the, the sum total of all of our war dead. If not, it's really close, and that is disgusting. What have we become? Selfish. Comfortable. It's so important for us to be able to... Even why? Like, and And... When you look at the motivation behind it for these abortion clinics, you look at the money that comes in when they they sell the aborted body parts and they sell and you think, oh, they're trying to help that 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 woman. That's that is as ignorant as you can get. It's not about letting a woman choose it's not about it has nothing to do with it they it's always been about corruption and control and it's disgusting the complete hypocrisy well i guess it's not hypocrisy but my body my choice you well know, yeah that applies if you like you want to get a tattoo or pierce your cheek or i don't know some other weird shit there's a cat. Um, sorry. <laughs> when it comes when it comes down to the my body my choice argument, that's not factually correct because that is in fact another person's body. Yeah, you're you're the host, but it, it, ultimately, it's another human being, another individual. And any way you mince the argument, it's like, oh, but it's required, it can't live on its own, it can't breathe on its own. It's like, 
There are people in the hospital that can't breathe on their own. There are people, and you know. they're required by law to do everything they can to keep it alive. And Whereas I if you botch an abortion, you know what they do with, with, with it? They kill it. They put it in basically a rubber-made tote, close the lid, and walk away. Obama, oh, I remember Obama, he had, um, there was some woman who she wanted to have an abortion and she had decided too late or something and I don't know, some, maybe it was botched or something like that, but she was in the hospital and she basically put her baby in, in the closet to die and just left it there. And the, the nurse, I could be remembering the story wrong, but the nurse found it and held the baby until it died or something to that effect. And the mom was mad at the nurse for, for treating that as a baby when she's like, it should have been an abortion. And, and Obama, like, defended the woman. He defended the woman who just killed her baby. And this was before he was elected as president, if I remember right. But it's just like the, the sickness of our society to actually not bat an eye and to not, to not make a big deal out of how evil people are. You can't, we can't allow the evilness to just be part of us. That's, it's, there's, we've, we've, as a society, we've made it un, unpopular and it's bad to shame. And it's like, shame is one of those things that it can be wrong, but it can be, it, it, you see it, especially in like here in Utah where everybody's members of the church and you see people shaming others and it's just wrong. But shame itself, there's a reason that it's a societal thing. You should shame some something when that's doing something wrong like that. Like, there's, there's, you shouldn't be okay with, oh, well, I guess I have to be tolerant of that, that, my idea. And it's like, no, that's a wrong idea. Abortion's wrong. I, I think one of the real tragedies, like with the botched abortions, where the child ends up being born alive. And placed in the totes to die. That that child who should be loved and taken care of is placed in a container. Naked and cold and afraid. Hungry. And just abandoned. And I see and hear stories and stuff like that and... You know, I sit there and I think, you know, we really do deserve whatever, just whatever punishment the Lord decides to send down upon us as a society. Not only do we deserve it, we've earned it. The people who do it and the rest of us who sit by and don't do anything about it. I think I've only ever contacted my representatives about it once. So in a way, I'm, you know, not in a way, I am guilty of it as well. Me too. I've talked to people, I've done, like, I've, I've tried to do things to, to make people more aware of the tragedy of abortion. But writing representatives, I haven't done that on, on that specific topic. And I need to. Well, I, as far as talking to people about it, I have found that it's a very unpopular opinion. Oh yeah, I actually wrote a song about it that <laughs> I <laughs> singer songwriter Fred. God, and and it's regular something old I, Marty Robbins, aren't you? <laughs> I um, you I don't even I remember, know who Marty Robbins is, do you? I have no idea who Marty Robbins is. <laughs> I'm an uncultured. I hate you. <laughs> uh, why? Why? Why, is, are you, why are you like this? <laughs> this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I wrote a song, and I remember I was like, I was like super pumped about it because I was like, this is like something that I need to get out and stuff. And I remember like starting talking to my brother or starting, you know. And my wife's like, you gotta take it easy. Like you're scaring people. <laughs> 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 I just, I'd, I, we'd, be, I'd be random, like, hey, I wrote this song about abortion. They're like, they're like. Doing, what? <laughs> doing the right thing has become extreme. <laughs> God. And the thing is, like, when 
there, here's the perspective that I have. Like, it's less productive to try and sit and yell at people who have had abortions. But those those girls who are don't know what to do and they're completely like on their own and they don't have a, a social structure that helps them and they don't have the family that helps them. It's like try and help those kids. Help them not do screw up their life worse. Like help them to not be everybody everybody that is influencing them is saying, Yeah, this is the easy way out. Here's you just go have an abortion and nobody's giving them the the perspective of this is wrong and you're going to have questions about it the rest of your life. Um, some some people honestly may not know better. I'm not saying that's an excuse, but some people may not know any better. Can you imagine being a person that does, or a couple that does, and then finding out the truth later? That is a horrifying thought to me. Absolutely horrifying. But, I mean, like I said, it's an, un, it's an unpopular topic, and there's some people that are unhappy with me about my views on it. And some people, I think, try to get a rise out of me by saying, yeah, I've had a couple of girlfriends do it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, yeah. there's things that I want to say. And I want to say, if you are that selfish, then that's on you. But I try to remember, <laughs> and I try so hard. <laughs> I try to remember, you know, it's not my job to judge you. You may not understand Personally, I think it's just because you're selfish. Just because somebody gets pregnant doesn't mean that you guys have to keep it, have to take care of it. You should, if, if you don't want it, you already made the mistake. Somebody else shouldn't have to pay for that mistake. The child shouldn't have to pay for that mistake. No. So why not just do an adoption? That's so, saying it's going to ruin my body doesn't cut it. It's going to ruin my body again. What's the core motive on that? That's selfishness. It's straight up selfishness. Well, and on the man's side, it's I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> Money. Oh my gosh. Money is an important thing. It is a very powerful motivator to most of us. But a human life. It's not my place to judge. I hope I'm never called on to be a judge <laughs> at the end. I love that it, I love that Christ said, judge not lest you be judged. I remember when I first, listening to that when I was a kid, I remember thinking, oh, if I just forgive everything, then everything's going to be forgiven me. It's like, it's a bit naive, but it's, there's also some, there's some, I don't know, good thought there. But I don't think it's sufficient to just forgive everything because God's not going to, he can't look on sin with the least degree of allowance. That being said, we're not going to be perfect. This no. is, this is, we're, we're, we're going to do our best and there's a big gap between what Christ will fulfill. His, his atonement has, is very important in that. And it's like, that being said, we, we do need to, judge others it's not oh don't judge it's judge others righteously like don't be and there was light <laughs> don't don't be judgmental in the sense of like a flippancy and a better than thou and like that kind of stuff because you're not. We all are just sin differently. We're all people it's, trying to... It's not our job to condemn others. No. That type of judgment. Yeah. But it's also not our job to... Oh, I can't judge others, so it's okay for you to... It's okay for you to... To, to murder babies. Murder babies or be a pedophile or be... You know, there's there's so many things in this world that we cannot be okay with. It's wrong to just be okay with them. We named, we named this 
I guess I'll call it an, an experiment. <laughs> we named we named this Elders Rising for a reason. We need to rise and we need to stand for what we know is right and what we know is correct. There's there's the the saying from the Declaration of Independence that always just strikes me so hard and not just in the context that it was written for that but we hold these truths to be self-evident which applies to so many things and when it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that applies to the unborn you can't just, I can't just go up and decide to abort you at 34 years. <laughs> what gives you that right to the unborn? And there's the argument, well, when does life really begin? Well, in my opinion, at conception. That's what I believe. And if not at conception, definitely when you have a heartbeat. But there's... The, there's the fact that if they found a single cell bacteria on Mars, the science community would say, oh, there's life. There's life on Mars. Yeah. If you were to go pick up a bald eagle egg and smash it, or eat it, whatever you want to do with it, that's like a $180,000 fine. And you're going to prison. <laughs> but you can kill a human baby. Priorities. All right. Like I said, if the mother's life is in jeopardy, that's one thing. It's a decision that you would have to make. And I don't think it would be an easy one. And I, f I feel terrible for anybody who would have to make that decision. But that is, in my opinion, about the only justifiable reason for it. And I don't, I don't think God would cast judgment on you for that. Especially if you already have six kids. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it, there's better dads out there than me, but if... <laughs> if it ever came down to that and it was just me, my kids would be screwed. They're probably screwed already anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, it's... Getting... Sorry, go ahead. I don't know. I was going to say, getting back to the Elders Rising thing, though. It's it's time for us to talk about things that are uncomfortable. It's time for us to, to not be afraid to mention that abortion is wrong. That pedophilia is wrong. That all of these things that are going on is wrong. It's time to be okay saying that our government's getting too big. We're, again, there's, today we didn't talk about the Constitution. We we wanted to study a little more. It's, as we mentioned before, it's been busy weeks for both of us, and we didn't want to... It's been a damn nightmare. <laughs> we didn't want to get halfway through or, or, or sell you short in that sense, because mm -hmm. we do want to give you good, good um, content and, and what the Constitution is. It's important enough that we spend the time to be able to adequately break it down to, to gain the best understanding that we can. Yeah. Because that's important and that's the ultimate goal of this project is to help people better understand the Constitution. And when, we apologize that we didn't get to that this week. At least I do. Fred probably doesn't care because he's a <clears throat> One of the things, though, that I was going to say is, like, I'm glad that that we are focusing on the Constitution, but um, one of the things, that my personal belief, is that a lot of our problems are spiritual problems. A lot of our problems in society right now, they're downstream from the fact that we have turned our backs on God. And we, as a as a people, 
not saying individuals, but as a people. I mean, even even here in Utah, you'll you there's you'll hear stories of of covens of witches in in cities that are trying to cast spells on representatives and stuff like that. And you'll hear stories of like, yeah, it's probably what five or six teens that are just trying to be edgy and that kind of stuff. But it's like there there are people that we we don't we we don't trust in God and we don't trust in our fellow man. We've lost the trust for each other because we're not worthy of trust in on in a general sense. You can't just trust your neighbor all the time. And that's that's a problem. We need to we need to bring goodness. And you need to bring goodness to those around us. And that comes through the constitution, but it also comes through being a good person and, and living the way Christ taught us, treating others the way Christ wants, and that gets others to, tr- to, to do good as well. Good begets good. And that's something that I, I hope to, that we can also get through in this. Yes, we need to awaken our eyes to our dire situation. Not only do we need to rise up, we need to plant our banner and draw our lines that are not to be crossed. We need to have our title of liberty as our standard. We need to stand for what's right. Stand for what's right and what's good. You may lose friends. That's okay. They probably weren't your friends to begin with anyway. Life isn't a popularity contest. If you try to make it so and be loved and be held by all, then you're just going to be miserable. If you haven't lost a few of your friends as you've grown up, you haven't done much growing up best life advice I can give to anybody is to not give a shit. <laughs> that's what I do. It's worked pretty well for me in a lot of aspects. Well, maybe that's not very good advice. <laughs> as far as far as people liking me and being accepted, I'm vocal about my opinions and what I believe. And that's not very popular with some people, but I really don't care. We know that we have an obligation to stand and say and do what's right and defend what's right, and we need to do that. We've been told that that's one of the things that's required of us. So we need to do it. And here's the thing that's very um, freeing, in my opinion. When you look at Christianity, when you look at, I'm talking outside of just the church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. When you look at Christianity, it started with 12. Christ at head, but all it took was 12 good men for it to be spread throughout the nations. Look what happened to 11 of them. Well, I guess bad things happened to all 12 of them. But that's the thing, is like, we, it, it only takes a few good men, a few good people to spread God's will. And that's, just, just be one of those people to those around you. Be one of those people in your community. Be one of those people in your neighborhood. Be one of those people when you go to work. Make it easier for those around you to live with freedom in their mind, with, with, Christ in their hearts. Just be, make it easier. Don't don't be someone who's tearing others down. Unless they're stupid. <laughs> Isn't that all of us? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna be a real movie nerd right here, but uh, the the these things just popped into my head as we were talking about this. Uh, and I don't know, I don't know if you've ever seen it. I don't know who, if, if anybody does watch these things <laughs> or listen. Um, I was just thinking about the movie, The Patriot. 
um, the the last battle in the movie. Um, they're they're fighting the British, obviously, and everybody starts to fall back. And Mel Gibson, his character goes and he takes the flag from the fa- from the flag bearer, and he says no retreat, and he gets starts running back towards the line. And that that stuck with me when I when I saw it the first time uh, eons ago, however long that damn movie's been out. <laughs> and the other the other reference, well, anyway, he, he he runs back to the front of the line, and everybody turns around and follows him. The other reference I wanted to share, and I've shared this with you before, is in the Lord of the Rings: The Return of the King, when. Whatever the the city in the mountain, Minas Tirith is being see, laid siege on, the 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 riders of Roh, Rohan show up and they line up and they're looking at this these impossible odds, absolutely impossible. And Theoden rallies rallies up his man and gives them. You know, this little speech, and then he yells death, and the rest of them yell death, and they do it three times, and then they just charge. The point that I'm getting at is it only takes one to lead the charge, to get others to follow. Maybe it's you, maybe it's us, maybe it's somebody who who knows, but that that's the point I'm trying to make and if you haven't seen those movies yeah the Patriot's pretty bloody and it's rated R but there's powerful (laughs) lesson to be learned in that movie and if you haven't watched it watch it Um, and the same with Lord of the Rings you can watch that one I'm sure anybody that watches this has watched those movies but think think about those contexts when you watch the movie and I think it'll take on new meaning and really resonate with you that even when you're facing impossible odds and I I know I know from experience how terrifying it can be to be at that impossible odds and have to hold your ground anyway it's terrifying it's hard in this society, it's a different kind of terrifying, and it's a different kind of hard, but that's not an excuse. The thing that's also true is that it's terrifying in our minds, but the the things that are that we have to do is usually just say something, just speak up, and it's you're not going to have to lead a death charge. Exactly. Probably the 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 courage that it takes is the courage of, oh no, that person's not going to like me anymore. Versus, that person's trying to kill me. And that person's trying to kill my family. We're not there yet. We're not in that state where people are trying to kill your family. They're not trying to kill your kids. Or kill your your colleagues, or your brothers, or your your wives. Wife? (laughs) <laughs> if there are more people, but what I'm what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at though is we don't practice the, polygamy anymore. Thank the, goodness. The, the fear, the fear is really only as deep as, oh no, they don't like me, and it's like, okay, then it's not scary anymore. Once you accept that, that oh, someone might not like you. Okay, that's if it's anybody. <laughs> If it's anybody worth maintaining a relationship with, it's not going to ruin it. Yeah. If it was somebody that it was not worth maintaining a relationship with, then it wasn't worth it. It's it's interesting. The people that I really value that I'm thinking of a right now, I'm thinking of a, a a really good friend at work, and we've had some good conversations. I don't work with you. <laughs> We're working right now for free. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna this say way easier than my everyday job. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, the thing that I was that that I was getting at is 
he it was it, i wanted to bring up something and i was like i don't know how to bring this up because we were talking we were getting into politics we're getting into stuff that like you don't usually get into at work and he was like honestly you could say anything and i i could not agree with you and that's fine but i'm not gonna hate you for it he's like because I, I know that you'll explain what you're thinking and there's going to be some sense to it and i might agree i might not but it's like i don't mind listening to your idea and, and so he let me explain some of my some of my thoughts, and I don't remember what this one was. Maybe it was something like abortion. I know I shared I shared the abortion stuff with him, and we've talked about some heavy stuff. And he and it, it's like we've talked about guns. We've talked about stuff like that. And I love guns. <laughs> yeah, and it's he's he's a friend that I value his friendship because he also I don't know he's just a good man, and it's like there there are people that are good people. And when you share your opinions with them, even if you guys disagree, you don't have to stop being friends. You don't have to. It's 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 not as scary as you think it is. Just speak, speak the truth, and let the chips fly where they are, fall where they are. Amen. All right. I don't have a preparedness tip. Uh, I do. Spiritual preparedness this week. We just talked about that for an hour and 21 minutes and 14 seconds. There was a spiritual preparedness tip I was thinking of, and I couldn't. Rem- I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Oh. I was thinking about it earlier this week. I was like, you know, but we really have been talking about it a lot today, so <laughs> enough with the, the touchy-feely stuff. Um, I guess... My preparedness tip for this week would be to learn how to tie snares and different knots and stuff like that. And having having plenty of cordage and rope and like 550 cord is pretty valuable. Doesn't take up a whole lot of room. It's pretty cheap and you could use it for anything. Literally anything. You can, it's got like nine little strands on the inside and you can take them out and you can use those for fishing line and other little binding things and learn how to build an impromptu shelter if you're ever lost in the woods if you have if you're ever going out into the woods and you have a pocket knife you know how to tie a snare and make a simple shelter you'll be fine until somebody finds you Unless you get eaten by a bear, then you're screwed. I convinced my boy that I... <laughs> that I fought a bear with my bare hands and ate it. <laughs> he thought I was cool for about ten minutes until he told my mom, or told my wife about it. And she said, no, he didn't. Said, Damn it, the boy idolized me for a minute. <laughs> Mom, did you know Dad fought a bear with his bare hands and then ate it raw? <laughs> oh, that was awesome. <laughs> That's great. Oh, um, but yeah. So, I I honestly feel like what we're saying and what we're doing needs to be said. And I, I, th- I think the preparedness part is, we don't spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but I think that's an important part of the preparations that we also need to be making. And we've talked about it, I think, about every episode. Yeah, and we're getting better at it as well. Uh, maybe. Maybe. I am. I know you are, but what am I? Doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> um, it's 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 one of those things that. Thank you for joining us on this ride. You know we're we're not perfect by any means. We're just doing I'm our best. We're doing our best. You're clothed. That's different. Right. We're doing our best to get um, 
we're we're doing what we can and rock the party. Oh no no, <laughs> that is the gayest thing, the gayest thing ever. Well, other than like the actual gay stuff. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, it's episode eight. Uh, what is that? Skywalker's Rising episode. Oh, that's nine. number nine. What's next week's episode? Next week's episode on Skywalker's Rising. The Last Jedi? Yeah, The Last Jedi. Seven, eight, nine. Right. What are we gonna do when we hit episode eleven? Uh, Ten. I don't know. I'll probably start dropping Mandalorian references. Oh god. This is the way.